Well, you came my way because you were interested in learning about lactones, and I'm very happy to tell you everything I know about lactones. I mean, if you're that interested in them, well, sure, we'll have a conversation, not a big deal. And, you know, thanks for stopping by. So let me kind of give you the rule book uh, to play the game. And lactones are kind of a game. They're kind of a puzzle to figure out, especially in the very beginning. So let's just take a lactone, shall we? C double bond O, O. And this is going to create a ring. So off of this oxygen, I've got a carbon and then another carbon and then maybe another carbon. And then up we go. There we go. All right. So a carbon's here, a carbon's there, and a carbon's here. This is how we name lactones. The rules of IUPAC always, always said, you start at the functional group that you're going to name it as. Okay, well, that's here. There's carbon, so there's carbon number one. Hopefully that wasn't very complicated. You kind of saw that one coming, maybe. Next is that we go toward the side that has more of the functional groups that are associated with it. Well, we're kind of handcuffed here. There's only one option. And that one option is to the O. That is really what makes this a lactone. So if I have to number this, my second spot, folks, is right there. That is spot number two, because now I've included the entire functional group right there. It's not just C double bond O. In order for this to be a lactone, this has to be the lactone piece in a ring. So by default, I have to go to the oxygen for spot number two. For that reason, that is why that these names always, always, you don't hear me say that often, always end or start with two oxy. When we name lactones, that will always be the beginning of the IUPAC name for these structures. No matter what kind of structure that we have there, because that oxygen is always going to take spot number two. So it always has to be a two oxy something. Okay, well, two oxy what? Well, it's a ring, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a ring. Okay, how do you name rings? Well, let's see. Back in 251, we put the word cyclo in front. Okay, well, we do the same thing here. We'll put cyclo in front. There you go. It's two oxy cyclo something. Well, what is it cyclo something of? Okay, well, here's a carbon one. There's a carbon two. Here's a carbon three. There's a carbon four. And then if I go up to that oxygen, that would be kind of spot number five. It's not all about the carbon here. It's about the type of ring. How many things are involved in the ring? And oxygen is included when we IUPAC it like this. So what that means is that this is a cyclopentane. But there's a modified ending. You knew this was coming. We drop the E. And what do you think we're going to add? What do you think we're going to add? If you had to pick out something, what do you think we're going to add on to the end of this name? You do it just like you've always done it. This is a lactone. Lactones end in O-N-E's. And guess what? These names end in O-N-E's. There you go. 2 oxycyclopentanone is going to be the IUPAC for this structure. All right. Now, I'm not going to talk about common name yet. Whew, that's a different whole ball game there. So let's go to another molecule and let's just do this one more time to see if we feel a little bit more comfortable with what they're getting ready to get me to do. All right. So here's a structure. We name it just like before. There's my carbonyl, carbon number one. There's my oxygen, carbon number two. So this is still a 2-oxy. Same stuff. It's still a ring. It has to be a ring. Otherwise, it's not a lactone, is it? 
Okay, so that means Soclo has to be part of this name. Well, what is it a Soclo of? Well, one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, and that oxygen makes member number six. Member, member, member. South Park fans, member grapes. Well, here we got a member, and that is an oxygen. All right, so cyclohexane. Uh -uh. No, it's not a hexane. I need to erase that E, and I need to put the proper ending on it. It is a lactone, so I need to end this in own. 2 oxy cyclohexanone is going to be the IUPAC name for that lactone. All right, let's do another. Here, let's keep the C double bond O, just like it was from up above. We'll keep a six-membered ring, just like it was from up above. And here, we'll write a methyl. How do we handle something like that? Remember, we take baby steps and we build and build and build and build. So what if I threw something like this to you? What would it be called? Oh, well, use the IUPAX from up above. Okay, so this is carbon number one, part of the carbonyl. There's my oxygen, so there's number two. So this is still a two oxy. Look, it's all the same, folks. It's all the same for all the examples. It's still a cyclo group, isn't it? Yes, it's still a cyclo. It's still a ring. It's still a hexane, isn't it? There's carbon, and there's carbon 2, and there's carbon 3, and there's carbon 4, and there's carbon 5, and there's an oxygen, which, member number 6. So this is a hexane. Okay, well, we erase the E. There you go. We add the word own, and you clap your hands, and you say, I'm done, and I mark it wrong, and I say, eh, eh. <laughs> Okay, well, what's wrong with this structure? What do we leave off? We left off a methyl group. We left off that stinking methyl group that's down here. We've got to include that into the name. How do we do it? You do it just like you've always done it. If this is carbon number one and this is spot number two, folks, that means that this is spot number three. And on that third spot, we have a methyl group. There's no difference. That's the way that I include it in IUPAC. It's the way that I've always included in IUPAC. So the name of the structure is 3-methyl-2-oxy-cyclohexanone. 3-methyl-2-oxy-cyclohexanone. Can you say that three times fast? So that's how we handle things like that in the IUPAC system. So what that means is that this would be carbon number four, and that's carbon number five, and this is carbon number six. So if they give me a substituent, and that substituent is on there in some form or fashion, I now know how to handle that. Okay, so up here at the top, let's do one more example. Here's a C double bond O with an O. And let's just do this number, and let's put a skeletal structure right there. That almost sounded like a steak sizzling, didn't it? Okay, so let's name this one. You do it just like before. There's carbon number one. Here's spot number two. There's spot number three. Here's spot number four. Okay, so what that means is that this is a lactone. There's the ester group in a ring. So at spot two, I have the oxy. And this is a cyclo. It has to be. It's a five-membered ring all the way through. So pentane, drop the E, and add own. So cyclopentanone. However, on spot number four, because carbonyl is number one, oxygen's number two, carbon is number three, the next carbon's number four. At number four, I have a ethyl group this time. So four ethyl. 2-oxy cyclopentanone. Folks, there you go. That would be the name of that structure. Now, these were IUPACs. You felt good about those, right? 
We had a system going. We had a procedure going. It was flowing. You were rotting. You were like, yeah, I got this. I got this. And now I'm getting ready to hit you with the common names. Oh, gosh. Another common name system with all of these functional groups. I warned you. I warned you. I warned you. So let's go back to the very first one that we did. And we're going to common name 2-oxycyclopentanone. How is this going to change? Well, in the common nomenclature system, we use the word lactone. Uh, that's kind of what we've been doing in a way almost. But here we use the full-blown word. We use the word lactone in the common name. So that means when I common name this system, I'm going to end this with lactone at the end. Okay, well, what kind of lactone do we have? This is what we do. You look at the total number of carbons. That's the thing. You don't count the oxygen. Oh, God, why do they make it so complicated? That's just the way it is. Don't ask me. I didn't make the rules. So you count the total number of carbons for the lactone. So that means there's one, and there's two, and there's three, and there's four. There's four carbons in total in a line, all connected together. Four car carbons, what's the common name? Well, it was butyr, B-U-T-Y-R. Well, some people will put an O here, butyrolactone. If you leave off the O, it's okay, but that would be butyrolactone. It looks a little funny. It looks a little strange. It looks like something needs to be in between butyr and the lactone piece. So we use an O for that purpose. So butyrolactone is going to be the name, but it's not the only part of the name. There's something else that we have not included yet. And that's this concept that we have focused on the carbon chain. At no time did we ever include that oxygen as part of the ring. What does that even mean? Well, remember this carbon? We said that is the carbon of the carbonyl. And the carbon beside of that is the alpha carbon. And the carbon beside of that is the beta. And the carbon beside of that is the gamma well, it still holds true for ring systems like this. So in the common nomenclature field, we would look at this structure and we would say that this is called a gamma butyrolactone. I know it's, it's not very good, is it? You're probably looking at this saying, what on earth? Or you could look at this and be kind of a weird one and say, hey, I get this. It's much better. It's much easier than the common name. I don't think it is. But if it is to you, then good for you. But most people hate this common nomenclature system. Gamma butyrolactone. We put gamma in the front because gamma is the area where it's connected to the oxygen. So this gamma represents where that oxygen is attached to in the ring. It tells me. This oxygen is attached to the third carbon after that carbonyl carbon. And the word lactone basically takes the place of the cyclo part of the IUPAC name. Oh, gosh. Well, let's do another example. That's why I did four. It gives us more practice. So let's take a look at our next one. 2-oxycyclohexanone. Well, we do the same thing here. We're going to use the word lactone. We know that. So here is the carbon that starts that system. And here is the alpha, and there's the beta, and this is the gamma, and this is the delta. And that's where it connects to the O. So that means in my nomenclature, this is a delta. It's a D with a little squiggly. A delta something. Well, how many carbons in total? Well, one, 
2 and 3 and 4 and 5. There are five carbons in total around that system. So the word for five carbons in the common nomenclature system is valer, V-A-L-E-R. Well, just like up above, I'll put an O in here. If I don't, it looks weird. And then I write the word lactone. So valero lactone. Delta valero lactone. Lactone is telling me that it's a ring system. Valero means there are five carbons in total. One, two, three, four, and five. And the delta means that on that carbon, the delta carbon, that is where the oxygen is attached of the ester group to make it a lactone. Now, let's take a look at this last or this third one that's at the bottom of the page. 3-methyl-2-oxycyclohexanone. How do we common name this thing? Well, let's use the rules that we've already talked about and let's follow through with them just like what we've learned. So I know that this is going to end in lactone. No big deal. And I know that I'm going to start my carbon here. There's my first one. And I count the total number of carbons, right? Yes, I count the total number of carbons. All right, so here is one, and there is two, and here is three, and there is four, and here is five. But here is number six. It's part of the main chain. It's a continuous carbon, and I include it because of that. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, that is the longest carbon chain. So I need to use the common name for a 6-carbon chain, which is capro. It's a caprolactone. Now, I've got to figure out a way to describe to you where the oxygen is connected. And we do that the same way. So this is the alpha, this is the beta, this is the gamma, and folks, this is the delta. So this is still a delta, still a delta, because that's where the oxygen is connected. It's on the delta carbon. That is why we start off with that. And then capro means there are six carbons in a line, and they are. They're all in one continuous straight chain. However, the oxygen is connected to the delta carbon, and it's a lactone, which means it's part of a ring that has a ester group. Now, we've got one more. So one more is up there at the very top. So how would we common name something like this? All right, so we do the same thing as before. We're going to start off with the word lactone. I know it's got to be a lactone. I mean, goodness gracious, give me some points for that at least. There's the first carbon of the chain. So there's carbon number one. And this would be carbon number two. And there's carbon number three. But in order for me to get to that oxygen right there, that's carbon number four. I have to bypass this right? That's not really part of the main chain. I don't include it. And the reason it's not part of the main chain is because if I went to that spot and went down, then I bypass that oxygen and I need to include that oxygen as part of the main name. That's why we call it a lactone. So I'm going to have to deal with this a little bit later down here at the very bottom. All right, so there's one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon of the main chain that's continuous. So four carbons is a butyro-lactone. Well, I do the same as they did before. This is the alpha carbon. That is the beta carbon. This is going to be the gamma carbon. So this is a gamma butyro-lactone. But we're also missing an extra piece, and that extra piece, as you know what's coming, is this two-carbon chain. And that two-carbon chain is an ethyl group. So that ethyl group has to be named. We're going to still call it ethyl. I mean, there's no changes there, but we can't use a number. We've got to use the Greek alphabet. I mean, that's why we did gamma here. we got to keep it consistent. So on the beta carbon, right, if this is alpha, this is beta, on the beta carbon, I have a ethyl group. So this beta 
goes to that ethyl and the gamma that's in front here tells me where the oxygen is attached in the lactone. So beta ethyl gamma butyrolactone is going to be the common name for that structure. All right. So folks, there it is. There is the nomenclature system for lactones with common and with IUPAC nomenclature. Again, two more to add to the growing list that has happened very quickly in the carbonyl world. And when I say quickly, you might feel overwhelmed at this point. And if you do, that is common. I don't want you to freak out. I don't want you to go through here and say, there is no way on earth I'm going to get this. There's no way. Yes, there is. Everybody makes it through the carbonyls. You will make it through the carbonyls. It is a lot. But I want you to go back and I want you to remember Chemistry 251 and the very first couple of lectures that we did included some nomenclature of alkanes. And I threw all of that IUPAC system at you. And with that was also the nomenclature of ethers and amines and alcohols. If you can do it in your very first semester in the first couple of weeks, because that was a lot of nomenclature that happened, you can do it here as well. There is no difference. Do not feel bogged down with this stuff. So my advice to you as of right now is to make a growing list. So we started off with carboxylic acids, right? And we said there is an IUPAC way to name them, and there is a common name to weigh them. So make you a table that has carboxylic acids, and we call these oic acids. That's the way that we call them in IUPAC. So that way, do the same thing with common. Then we went through and we did acyl halides. And we named acyl halides a certain way with IUPAC. We used the oils and then the halide term. How do we do it in a common name? Write that down. Make you a chart. Make you a quick reference sheet that you can use when you start working out all of these problems one by one. It will help you significantly if you take the time and do this on a sheet of paper. And just reserve that sheet of paper just for this. That's all that you want on it. Just the nomenclature rules, IUPAC in common for every single functional group that we're doing. So carboxylic acids we've talked about. A acyl halides we've discussed. Acid and hydrides we've discussed. Esters we have discussed. And now lactones we have discussed. There's five, at least five, that need to go into this chart right now. And we're not yet done. So there's going to be more to it. So this is why I'm telling you get organized over to the side on a new sheet of paper, create a nice little cheat sheet for yourself. That way you can say, oh, in this example, I've got an ester. And this is how I name the ester IUPAC, and this is how I name the ester common name. So that way you don't have to dig and find and rummage through pages and pages of notes that you might be taking. All right. So in the next video, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about our next functional group, and that next functional group is something called an AMID, A-M-I-D-E. So AMID, if you've witnessed the infrared spectroscopy lecture at this point, you know what an AMOD functional group is. If you forgot the AMOD, well, I'm here to, to kind of show it to you one more time, just like all the others. All the others were nothing new. Maybe lactone was. Uh, but all the others were something that we saw previous. So amide will be up next. Again, it will have its own IUPAC. It will have its own common. And guess what, folks? It also makes rings. So just like with esters and lactones, we're going to have amides. And guess what? Lactams. Oh, just when you thought the going was getting good. Lactones and lactams. You're now going to have to be able to determine the difference between. All right, so that's what we'll talk about in the next video. A mods up to bat.